the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Miller. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and stroke survivor. And today's episode is about living without a compass in those moments when we question our path. So trusting, putting a little more trust in the journey, almost like getting on the roller coaster, buckling in and just letting go. Um, And I want to talk about signs for me that I know that I'm on the right path. And what I was thinking about as I was writing up my script for this, I was thinking about how I don't know that I believe that there's one path that's right for me. I think it's if the path that I'm on is providing me with A, B, and C, then I know that this is a path that is good for me. So I'll get into uh, towards the end about what those things are that are signs to me that I'm in going in the right direction for me. And I want to talk about how I recognize those and, um, and know that as I'm in this recovery from my stroke and sobriety and all of these things that I'm navigating, how do I know day by day or minute by minute, hour by hour, like that I'm doing the right thing for me, for my path, you know, for the big picture. And I wonder if, if sometimes we don't put too much pressure on ourselves, um, identifying that path. I, it, it brings to mind as I'm talking, when My son graduated from college and he graduated right when COVID hit. So he didn't get a graduation. They just mailed him his certificate. And, you know, it was kind of one of those. um, To me, it was sad. He he communicated that it wasn't a big deal to him. But as COVID kind of uh, evened out a little bit, if it ever did, I don't know. But um he was was tossing around different ideas about where to move and what to do. And he thought, well, how do I know if this is the right thing? Like, I'm so afraid I'm going to make the wrong decision. And I believe that there is no wrong decision. It's, it's just which which path do you want to go down? There's so many different options. It's just like, um, I recently read a book about, uh, these parallel universes and the sky ends up crossing over and meeting some of the different identities of himself that chose different paths. And that's the thing. I I think that no matter which path we choose, we can still be going in the right direction for us. Um, So I'm sure that I feel like everybody must pause at some time, numerous times throughout their lives and wonder if you're on the right track. And one thing that I used to do a lot before I got sober, and I still do it now. I don't know why it's a thing for me, but where I picked it up, I actually looked it up after I started doing this and found out that it is in fact a thing. But I used to always look at the clock at night at 11.11 when I was drinking, um, as I was getting lower and lower into the depths of my alcoholism, I would look at the clock unplanned and every night it would be 11, 11. And I would think to myself, 
I'm on the right path. Like I'm, I'm right. Oh, it wasn't, I'm on the right path. It's I'm right where I need to be. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And, um, I don't know why I thought that, but I found out later as I looked it up that that's, a, that's a thing. There's something about when the clock hits 11, 11, something about it signifying, uh, that we're where we need to be or something. I can't remember exactly, but at times I was crying at times I was super happy and, and most of the time I was just plain old drunk, you know, like drunk, drunk. And sometimes I would be afraid. Um, and as I got lower and lower into my disease, I was getting more and more depressed and more and more hopeless, but I still would look at the clock and 11, 11, I was like, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> and I even, I think if I were to go back on Facebook, I mean, I can't scroll, so I don't know if there's a way to like search this, but I think if I were to go back like eight years ago in my Facebook, I think it would have a bunch of posts that say 11, 11, if I'm not mistaken. And that's what I, that's what I was doing. I was just drunk and I was looking at the clock, 11, 11. I'm right where I used to be. And people would like respond to it. I think a couple people. So why was I, why was I thinking I'm exactly where I was supposed to be? And today, if I think back to those memories, I think I was right. I was right where I was supposed to be. You know, it didn't feel like the right thing at the time. It it felt like my life was just sinking, just destroying, imploding, you know. And, but I just kept seeing that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And now, I think I shared about it yesterday, I know that I wouldn't be where I am today without having gone through all that stuff. So I was exactly where I needed to be at the time. And this question that um, I think we all ask ourselves really has been even more prevalent in my recovery. Um, am I doing the right thing? Am I going down the right path? It's been, it's really been all consuming for me, this idea of having worked, just going down what to me was a career path that just um, derailed. And how can that feel like the right thing? Well, it's interesting because as I've been slowly getting um, well enough to look at my computer for short periods of time, I've been thinking in my head, you know, all of this experience I has that I had have, sorry, as a marketing director, is very much um, something I can leverage in what I'm doing right now to share my voice about recovery. And I would never be able to share my voice as well as I am right now if I didn't have that background. Um, currently, I'm writing an article for a publication. I was in a local newspaper. Um, I've been slowly networking with other podcasters and I plan to continue to slowly share my story and um, as you know if you're keeping up I am also writing a book so there's so much writing uh, the skills that I learned at my last job for writing are absolutely being used now I mean, probably more than anything. And um, 
some of it I'm just dictating, but it's still putting, it's putting ideas into written, you know, written uh, communication. So today I I just wanted to talk about that a little more and and what the indicators are that reassure me that I'm continuing to head toward my true north um even though it feels like everything got derailed in my life and lately I've been looking at the clock again at 11 11 and it's like I'm like okay so it's like um what what can I compare it to it's like a snow globe it's like I've been inside of a snow globe and somebody just shook the heck out of it and it was chaos inside here and now everything is is slowly laying down flat again all the snow is is placing itself nice and calmly down at the uh, floor of the snow globe and now I can look up and see I'm right where I need to be still I'm right where I need to be. It wasn't where I planned to go. It wasn't how I thought it would happen. But I'm still right where I need to be. Everything is okay. Everything has been okay. Maybe things weren't okay (laughs) at certain points. um, But I, I got myself through it. Other I not only did I get myself through it, but I asked for help. I reached out for help and I got it. You know, help was there when I asked for it. So a couple things I wanted to talk about are, um, I guess, how I navigated some of this stuff. Um, So first, I wanted to talk about trusting that I have the wisdom and the tools that I already possess those. Um, to handle whatever comes. And I've mentioned this before, but there was a piece of advice that somebody gave my brother when my brother was um, running the family company that I was working for before, two, two jobs ago. And the executive of this big company said to my brother, Um, stop with the what ifs um, and trust in your wisdom and the tools at your disposal to manage what lies ahead. That it means believing in my capacity to overcome challenges without second guessing every step. About having faith in the skills that I have honed so far in my life's journey the resilience that I have built up, the coping strategies that I've learned as I've just been introduced to these challenges and I just figure it out, you know. I'm smart enough. I'm smart enough. I'm strong enough. And and I've the knowledge that I keep picking up along the way. Um, and this is in everything that we do. And it's it's raising kids, you know. We didn't get a book. Well, that's not true. I did get a book on, <laughs> on uh, what is it called? Uh, what to expect when you're expecting. And then I had what to expect the first year. So I did actually have a book, but um, but we really are going with what we, you know, the tools that we have gained throughout our lives to become parents. And when we start a new job. We're utilizing what we've learned throughout the course of our career to start that new job and trust that we have that, um, those skills. And navigating relationships, good relationships and bad relationships. relationships. I've learned to, to be okay with not knowing what's going to happen and not having control of the outcome. I'm not perfect at it, but and it's still scary, um, but it's a lot less stressful 
to not play out all the scenarios before something happens. It takes a lot of time and energy and creativity to imagine all the ways that I can fail at something before I even start. And I have to put myself in uncomfortable positions over and over again in order to learn not to do this. So that's what I'm continuing to do. And, and honestly, like, I went to the neuro-ophthalmologist, uh, gosh, has it been a month already? I don't know. Maybe not a whole month. Maybe it has, actually. I don't know. But when I was going to the neuro-ophthalmologist, I was so nervous. Um, like it was a test I was going to fail or something. Um, I'm sure, you know, I had every reason to be filled with stress, you know, whatever that comes out as if it's nerv nervousness or whatever, that's what I was feeling. Um, but when I went to the neuropsychiatric evaluation, I, I was not nervous. And the reason why is because I thought about my experience at the neuro ophthalmologist. And I thought there were, you spent so much energy, like burning energy, being anxious about something that you had no control over. All I had to do was suit up and show up. That's all I had to do. It's not like I had to know neuro ophthalmology. I just had to sit there and do what they told me to do. And they tested my vision system. So when I went to this neuropsychiatric evaluation, I used that experience that I had from the neuro ophthalmologist just a week before, maybe two weeks before, and, um, and thought, you know, I can't, all I have to do here is show up and they're going to test me for stuff. Um, yeah, it felt a little bit like they were testing how smart I was, but that's not what they were testing for. And all I had to do was just be and just answer questions and just do whatever it was that they told me to do. And so just in those um, two weeks, I took an experience that was very anxiety inducing for myself and I leveraged it in order to be better at the next one. And that's what I'm saying um, I need to keep doing is to keep putting myself in these uncomfortable positions over and over again and I can keep getting better at it. I can keep learning and, um, and recognizing the signs of, you know, even if it's just physical symptoms, like I'm shaking or my, uh, my heart is racing or something like that. Like I can identify, oh, you know, that happened two weeks ago and it did it for, I was doing it for no reason. I was nervous for no reason. So, um, it helps me to recognize that I can calm down, that it's not, there's no danger, you know, because that's what's happening. It's a fight or flight thing. Um, and I need to tell myself, hey, Rachel, there's no danger here. There's no danger here. And, um, and it worked. It actually worked at the neuropsychiatric thing. I actually was pretty calm when I went in there. So, Another thing is I also have to recognize that help is always there and it's waiting on the sidelines, like just ready to be called into my game, you know, ready to be called in. And the key is to practice to reach for it, practice reaching for it. And even and just as importantly, um, practice receiving it gracefully, um, irrespective of, of my mood and my pride. And this is something I've practiced with my boyfriend over the past year. I very much needed to, um, to kind of smooth out my pride a little bit and learn how to accept help and learn how to 
um, really know that when somebody is helping me, it doesn't mean that they're smarter than me or that I'm not good enough because that's what I always thought when I was growing up. And um, even not even just as I was growing up, like in my 40s, when somebody was helping me, it I thought it meant that I wasn't good enough. I can't do it on my own. So somebody has to help me. And I thought it was showing a weakness of mine, but it's not. And um, again, I have to practice accepting it and playing out those feelings, playing out the, I'm still good enough. You know, this person's helping me. I'm still good enough. And whether it's a supportive friend, whether it's a recovery group, um, my sobriety group, my sponsor, my boyfriend, my kids, uh, doctors, asking for help is a signal that I'm prioritizing my well-being. And the better I get at it, the more progress I'm making um, in my recovery. And it, this is a muscle that I have to keep exercising, just like all of these other things. Um, and it's the, it's the acceptance of support um, that allows me to share my recovery journey. Like that is, when I accept help from somebody, I'm no longer lugging this backpack of recovery on my back only. I'm now sharing the weight of it with somebody else. And that just makes everything a little lighter for me. And as I move through the challenges, especially in the past few months, I've seen that growth, and I've mentioned this, growth is not just the prize waiting at the finish line. It's ingrained in the very fabric of the challenge itself or the struggle. It's the process of pushing through the thing, whatever the thing is, when it gets tough and learning and adapting and becoming better or more than what I was yesterday. And if I find myself with these difficulties and I persist and I learn and I adapt, then I just know that growth is happening in real time. Like growth is happening while I'm struggling. It's not contingent on some sort of outcome, but it's happening right here, right now inside the struggle. And that was a mistake I had made when I first started the podcast. I kept saying, there's something waiting on the other side of this. And you know, I just have to believe something's waiting on the other side of this. And it took me a couple months to realize that it's, there's, it's not waiting somewhere. It's not waiting out somewhere for me on the other side of some mountain or something like it's right here. It's all right here. The opportunities, the growth, the joy, all of that stuff is already right here. Um, it's still here when we're struggling and it's still here when I'm unhappy. Um, and it's really comforting to know that. It's comforting to know that um, it's not something I have to wait for, but it's already here. I just have to choose to surface it. So how do I know that I'm on the right path? Recognizing that I'm on the right path is really, really subtle for me. But there are telltale signs that serve as affirmation that I am aligned with my values and I'm moving in the right direction for me. Um, 
Number one is peace of mind. When I'm on the right path, whichever path I chose, there's this underlying sense of serenity that permeates into my life, even in, amidst challenges, amidst all of the stuff that I'm going through, I still have this underlying blanket of serenity. My stress levels are low. It doesn't take, no, I should say it does take a lot to get me worked up or angry or anxious about something. Um, that's how I know that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm, you know, that I'm okay. And it's, I don't feel anxious about the unknowns ahead of me. So I've been dealing like I've been, I think, going up and down with that, with this idea of being okay with uncertainty. And some days I'm confused and frustrated. And then other days I'm just like, like I said, I'm strapping myself in and lifting my hands up and being like, wherever you take me, I'm fine with it. Um, and I think that that's important to acknowledge that that underlying sense of serenity, like it, it takes breaks. <laughs> it certainly takes breaks. It's not like I'm just constantly walking around here like kumbaya, everybody. It's not like that for me, but, um, but I have more times of serenity than not. And this comes from knowing that I'm living authentically and I'm being honest with myself and with others. If I am not being honest with myself and with others, it's not going to be there. No way, no how the serenity is not going to be there. I have got to be so in touch with myself and uh, what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking, um, all of these ideas, the self-talk. I have to listen and respond. And that's where all of these things that I'm doing come in. And that's what leads me to the, that blanket of serenity that just sits there. So that's one thing. Um, number two, continuous growth. Um, personal development is a clear sign for me that I'm on the right path. When I'm constantly learning and evolving and stepping out of my comfort zone, it means that I'm not standing still. And that's what happened when I left my job and had to start disability. I got uncomfortable. I got really uncomfortable. And I started this podcast, like, I don't know, out of nowhere, it just happened. And it drove me forward into this state of constantly learning and evolving and stepping out of my comfort zone. I don't know how it happened. It, it wasn't something that I had been, um, you know, scheming <laughs> in the back of my mind that one day I was going to be a podcast for Like, I never imagined that. But growth for me comes with discomfort. So I had to lean into something uncomfortable. I knew that. I had to lean into discomfort in order to manage what I was going through, in order to be okay. And so discom that discomfort is also um, accompanied by a sense of accomplishment and joy will surface. And that's what has happened um, with this podcast and everything that I've been working on right now. And the third thing, which is um, for you believers out there, <laughs> is synchronicity. So 
Life just seems to fall in place with a series of coincidences and synchronicities. It just does. I can't explain it, but it absolutely keeps happening in my life. It abs- And it started when I got sober. And when I got sober, I could start, uh, I was paying attention. I started being able to notice what was going on around me. And I, it, it's just been happening and it hasn't stopped. These opportunities seem to arise at just the right time. And the decisions I make lead me to even more opportunities. And that is what is happening. And this isn't to say that everything is perfect, but there is a pattern of events that feels like the universe is just affirming my choices. Um, a couple of things that come to mind that are kind of trivial, but when I was working at my, this most recent job, I, you know, on days that I would get really frustrated, I know I'm not the only one, but on days that I would get really frustrated with, um, people, places, and things at this job, I would go on to Indeed and look and see what jobs are out there. I can't be the only one who does that. So I would go out there and I thought, what would I really want to do? You know, if I left this job, what would I really want to do? Um, I love marketing and I loved the opportunity for creativity that the job that I had was giving me. Um, but what industry would I want to go into if I were to leave, if I were to actually take the energy and really try to do something, uh, go in a direction that I think my life should go, I thought I would like to focus on recovery. And I thought, well, I don't know if I would make as much money because I feel like all of that stuff is nonprofit. Um, I don't know if I couldn't, you know, I'm not a therapist. I don't have a medical degree. I, you know, and I was questioning, like, how could I get into that? Like, I could be a marketing director, you know, I could help market the company and all of the, you know, goings ons and stuff like that. But I thought I probably wouldn't make as much money. That's what I was thinking. I don't know. I'm just being honest about what I was thinking. And, um, and then what was the other thing I was thinking? That one really, like when I started the podcast, I hadn't even thought about that, that when I was at my job that I just left, I, I, I hadn't thought, wait, I hadn't thought when I started the podcast that I had been thinking that, that I wanted to go down this path of, of working in the recovery field. Um, and it just happened. Um, so no, I'm not working. I'm not getting paid for anything. I'm just doing something that I'm passionate about. So it's like, you know, would I rather have not had a stroke and still be at my old job? Yeah, (laughs) I would. I absolutely would. But with what, where my life has had to go with all of this happening, um, it's interesting how my life is aligning in this direction of recovery when I had already thought about that. Um, so it's interesting. That's just an example. Oh, the other example was, um, when I, I guess it was several years ago. I don't know why I was thinking this, but I was thinking if I were to lose, if I had to lose one of my senses, which one would I be willing to give up? Like if somebody said, okay, you got to give up, um, hearing, sight, taste, touch, and whatever, smell, uh, which one do you want to give up? I was thinking I would give up sight. That's what I was thinking. And then 
after I had the stroke, that's the sense that has been damaged. Um, anyway, I was just thinking all of these things because I like to think about that stuff. So, um, yeah, I feel like I'm always looking for these sort, sort of affirmations, you know, that, that my choices are leading me in the direction that, that is good for me. I don't know. That is where I want to be, where I'm happy. And um, I think it's important to note that being on the right path doesn't mean an absence of obstacles or difficulties. It's living with joy despite of hurdles, despite hurdles and, and reaffirms that I'm living as my best self and the person that I was meant to be. Um, I, I absolutely feel like I'm right smack in the middle of a hurdle <laughs> and, and I'm living with joy despite it. Um, some days are harder than others, but it's really, it's right there. My joy and serenity is, is still right there. I get tired. I'm human. But it's right there. And I'm on my path. Whether, you know, I've had a lot of different choices of what path I wanted to go down. And this is my path that I'm on. And I think that uh, that's the most important acknowledgement of all is that, um, that I'm my best self. I'm who I want to be on my path. And that's, that's what's the right path. Um, so that's what I have for you on the topic. And thanks for listening. I will talk to you tomorrow. Bye.